and just in case David creeps in while we're, we're, we're talking. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much for sparing the time. Um, hopefully a, a really interesting meeting. So much to cover tonight. I'll apologise in advance if we run a little bit over, but we do have a lot to get in. And um, and I'm particularly delighted to to welcome Yav, Yav Valkima from, from Groningen, who's um, going to give our talk tonight. Um, I've been um, I've been pestering you out for a couple of months now, and he's been tied up with um, with lockdown and looking after his kids and teaching during the day and catching up on his work in the evening. So um, we're, I'm really grateful that he's managed to find the time to talk to us about something which is very very close to our hearts. Um, so before we actually get underway with the presentation, I thought it might be nice to to just do our usual kind of whip round um, and say who we are. And, and say what our role is. Um, that's very useful because it will give you a, a kind of an understanding of, of what we do and, and what our roles are. As usual, I'll go down the, the names on the minutes. Um, oh, I think first we better do apologies, um, Christy. Yeah. OK, um, apologies. We have um, apologies from Kathy Partington, Tim Kenny, Robert Pickering, Alex Bell, um, and Claire Roberts, um, Council Officer, um, and also Sean Trainer and Stephanie Ward. Right, OK. Fine. OK, then, so running down the minutes in sequence then, um, Tammy. Good evening, uh, Tammy Hunt from the University of Chester Sustainability Officer. Thanks. Uh, Steve Hughes. Uh, yes, uh, Stephen Hughes and I chair the Chester Sustainability Forum. Thanks very much. Roy Newton. Hi, I'm Roy Newton. I'm the Transport and Investment Director at Ch Cheshire and Warrington Local Enterprise Partnership. Thanks very much. Stephen Perry. Hi, I'm Stephen Perry and I'm representing the, the Active Travel Forum on this, uh, on this uh, task force. Thank you. OK, Bernadette. Hello, Bernadette Bailey. I work for NHS Cheshire Clinical Commissioning Group and, and programme lead with the Living Well for Longer team. Great, thanks very much. David Beer. Good evening, I'm David Beer. I'm Senior Manager with Transport Focus, the National Watchdog. I'm also part of the South East Chester pilot group. Okay, thanks David. Mike Hogg. Good evening, I chair the Chester Residents Association's group. A particular welcome to Yap. I worked for Shell for 39 years based in Hague and was have gone again many times and even lectured at the University on International Marketing. So a special welcome to me to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Peter Bulmer. Hi, Peter Bulmer from Great Horton Parish Council, joint lead for South East Chester pilot with John Beckett. OK, great. Thank you very much. I think Alex is not here. So Alex Bell is not here tonight. Um, Andy Farrell. Hi there, Andy Farrell. Um, I'm leading the uh, Chester Central Smart Mobility Project uh, for the task group. I'm also representing the Chester Growth Partnership um, and the Chester Business Improvement District, the Town Centre Traders. Uh, OK. Great. Yep, thank you, Andy. Uh, I think Rob Pickering is not here tonight. Um, Tim Kenny. So, Anya Miller. Hi. I'm Anya Miller and I'm a representative from the Youth Senate. Okay, great. Thanks, Anya. Uh, Kathy's not here tonight. Nicola? Nicola Hello, um, I'm Nicola said from Marketing Cheshire. I'm the Commercial Director. Uh, we're the Tourist Board and Place Marketing Organisation for the sub-region. Great. Thanks very much. David Whitehead. He's on his way, just trying to get in there. I've <laughs> been trying to get in for a yeah, few minutes. Just sent the link again. OK, not to worry. Um, and uh, Christy? Uh, Christy Littler, Transport Manager at Cheshire Western Chester, uh, Secretariat for the group. Thank you. And Lynn Mackay. Um, Lynn Mackay, Cheshire Western Chester, supporting the meeting um, in a Secretariat role. Um, Councillor Claire Roberts, is she on the line tonight? Did you say Claire Roberts? Sorry. Claire Roberts, yeah. She sent apologies, sorry. Okay, that's fine. I thought she sent apologies. 
Um, myself, I'm Garfield Southall. I'm, I'm chairing the task force. I'm also just retired as Dean of Science and Engineering at the University of Chester. So welcome everybody. And um, I think at this point, it's probably just easier if I just pass over to you up and, and ask you to make your presentation. We're all looking forward to it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Garfield. I will try to uh, get the presentation. Um, uh, hopefully it will work. While you're doing that, I'll just remind people to please use the um, to turn your microphones off and it might help the bandwidth if you turn to your screen off while we're watching and put any questions you have in chat. So thanks very much. Um, no. I'm afraid it's not working, so it's always the same. I have a backup, so. Well, OK, I can. Yeah, if you can do that. I can do that. Just let me go and find it first. Right, and then I'll go into Teams. Just bear with me, everybody. Submit that and do that. Yeah, great. OK, and let me just put it into actual PowerPoint mode. Um, and play from start. There we go. Yeah, thank you very much. I recognize my presentation, so. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you very much for uh, for uh, uh, for having uh, me to give a presentation. Um, first of all, my name is Jaap Falkema. I'm from the city of Groningen. Uh, I work there for as a bicycle manager for the last couple of 12, 13 years from now. But I've uh, not been in the office uh, uh, many times uh, last year. So the presentation is, is much more of the period before, uh, of course, COVID-19. And, and yeah, things are quite different at the moment. Uh, but you can imagine that. Can I have the next slide, please? Well, uh, this is the uh, map of uh, Europe, the location of the Netherlands and, of course, uh, Chester. So we are right on the same line. Uh, can I have the next one? And then another one, that's the Netherlands. And the next one is the location where we are. We are quite in the north of the Netherlands, the biggest city there. Um, can I have the next one, please? That's an aerial uh, photograph of the city of Groningen. Uh, what you can see here, and that's why I have this one in the presentation, uh, you see a very densely uh, built uh, city center right in the middle. Uh, around the suburbs and in the rest of the region there is quite nothing it's empty uh, of course there are people living uh, uh, everywhere but we are a very um, yeah, dense city in a very uh, empty uh, area and this is very important to to know this uh, uh, i will show you in the next couple of, uh, of sheets uh, can i have the next one and the next one yeah, we are, uh, the city of Groningen has uh, 235,000 inhabitants uh, at the moment. Um, we are, uh, uh, it, it's growing and growing. We are one of the fastest growing cities uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, and one of the uh, demographic uh, things is that uh, our population is very young. Half of the population is even younger than 35, so it's a quite young city. Um, we are the sixth largest city in the, in the Netherlands now. Uh, we are sometimes changing fifth or sixth place, but at the moment it, we are the number six. Um, and we have 60,000 students uh, on the University and the University of Applied Sciences. Uh, and that number is still growing every year with a few thousand. Uh, so the number in a few years, it will be 65, 70,000. Um, half of the students live in the city itself. Uh, that's also part of the 50% the, the younger than 35, of course. And the other half of the students uh, live in the, in the area around uh, Groningen and they commute every day 
to and from uh, from the city. Um, the city of Groningen is a very important city in an empty uh, surroundings. And we have uh, about a catchment area of 1 million people. Uh, that means that some people who are who, who have to go, for example, to the hospital for a special uh, uh, injury or whatever, uh, sometimes they have to travel one hour or even more uh, because yeah, we have a university hospital. It's, it's the, the only one in the whole northern part of the Netherlands. Uh, so that means for some people they are uh, yeah they have to go to to Groningen and that's why we have a catchment area of so many people. Uh, can I have the next one? Yeah, this is a slide of the uh, political landscape uh, at the moment. Um, uh, we have since two years now we have 45 uh, political seats in our city council. Um, the the green uh, uh, parties are now in the coalition. Uh, of course, that's more than half of the total seats. Uh, the biggest one, the largest one, is the, the Green Party. They had a, yeah, a very good election two years ago, and that's why they are now uh, by far the biggest party in our uh, city council. Uh, the second one is the Labour Party, the PVDA. Uh, the third one is D66, that are the Liberal Democrats. Uh, they've lost the election two years ago. They were the, by far the largest, uh, and the Green Party was, uh, yeah, they, they switched, so to say. And the fourth party, that's the Christian Party, the Christian Union, and it's the first time uh, that the Christian Union is part of city council. Um, so together, they have more than 50% of all seats. Um, and to give you uh, another idea, um, the SP is, are the socialists. Uh, they have been in city council, also in a coalition uh, for many years, but not this period. Uh, the VVD is, the, is also a liberal, um, a liberal party. They also joined uh, the last uh, coalition, but not this one. Then we have the PVDD, that's the animal party. It's very famous in the Netherlands. Uh, another important one is, uh, is the CDA, that's the, also a Christian party, but it's very small in, in Groningen and it's uh, almost uh, any time the biggest, the biggest party, the largest party or the second largest party, uh, party in the Netherlands with the national elections. And another party is the PVV, uh, maybe uh, known, infamous, uh, this is the right wing party. And we have a few local parties, but they are not part of the coalition. Can I have the next one? Uh, yeah, one thing to, to talk also about the coalition uh, is that um, for cycling policy, it doesn't matter which parties are in the coalition because from right to, to left, all parties are uh, pro-cycling. So that's important to know. Uh, because there are many uh, uh, cities or many uh, countries where it's uh, yeah cycling is for green parties or for uh, 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 labor parties or whatever and not from liberal parties so it's important to uh, to know uh, some facts and figures about cycling in uh, Groningen uh, yeah in the city we have more than 200 kilometers of special infrastructure that means bicycle path bicycle lanes uh, or whatever, so 200 kilometers uh, uh, in total. And I always say, uh, except for the for the highways and the ring road around Groningen, you can cycle everywhere. So the total infrastructure is of course far more, but special infrastructure is is 200 kilometers. Um, yeah, of course, uh, cycling uh, happens everywhere, uh, but there are some routes. Uh, in the city which, which are uh, more important than others. Um, and we have now uh, some routes, they have on a daily base more than 15, uh, between 15 and sometimes even more than 20,000 cyclists a day. So we don't have one route with 20,000 cyclists a day, but we have uh, tens of routes with that numbers of cyclists. Um, and another thing nice to know is that uh, it, it's far you can go much faster by bicycle from A to B than by car, because within a distance of uh, 10 minutes, 
you can almost reach the outskirts of the city and by car uh, that takes a longer time. So that's one of the reasons why many people cycle in Groningen so much. Uh, can I have? Yeah, thank you. Uh, another thing is, of course, the model split. Um, in the left uh, uh, side of the slide, you can see the model split in the municipality itself, so in, in the city of Groningen. Um, almost 50% of, uh, of all transport um, uh, uh, which is made uh, on a day, working day, is done by bike. A quarter is by, by foot and uh, one third is done by car. Public transport is very, very low uh, because yeah, it's not a really alternative in, in the city itself because it takes too long, it's expensive, more expensive than cycling. Yeah, and it takes a lot of more more time and yeah, it's not a real uh, option. Uh, the model split to and from Groningen, which I, I showed you on the third slide, we have a very rural uh, area around the city. Um, yeah, cycling is, is in many ways, it, it's too far. Of course, with the e-bike or the speed pedelec, much more people now uh, go by bike to the city. But if you have to cycle uh, 30 kilometers each day, many people prefer to go by or public transport, which we promote, so by bus or by train. And uh, yeah, still a large part of, of the uh, transport is done by car, uh, because in a low density area, uh, not everybody has a bus stop or a railway station in the neighborhood, so they have to, uh, to travel uh, by car. Can I have the next one? And the next one, please. Yeah, then I will start a little bit uh, uh, talking about history because it's now 2021, but uh, things uh, uh, went this way, of course, during uh, one night. Um, we always say uh, our bicycle policy, our real bicycle policy started in 1977, so almost 45 years ago. So you have to, to have a long breath. Um, and I will first talk some uh, uh, some details about the traffic circulation plan of the 1770s. Can I have the next one, please? Yeah, we had, uh, like many cities in the rest of the world, in Europe, we had in the 60s and 70s uh, many cars. Uh, um, and uh, the, the, the number of cars were increasing. So... Uh, we had to make uh, to build new roads, we had to widen existing roads, we had to make uh, new parking garages, etc. Uh, these photographs are uh, from the 60s and 70s, of course, and they are right in the middle of the city center. On the right uh, top, uh, where you see all those cars parked, it's, uh, it's our fish market. It's one of the two main squares of the city center. Uh, if you are going there now, and I will get a picture a few slides later, um, it's, it's totally different from now. Uh, cars aren't there anymore, um, but in the 70s, 60s, 70s, it was a uh, uh, yeah, parking spot. Also, the other pictures, the, the one, um, the black and white photograph uh, uh, down uh, is quite near our uh, uh, city hall. Where, where I work normally every day. It was a, a road with, with a few um, yeah, traffic lanes. You, you see a bicycle path in the middle, so that was very uh, uh, special then. Uh, but you can also see traffic lights, etc. So it was totally different from the situation nowadays. Um, and with the, the increase of cars in the 60s and 70s, um, our city government then uh, decided to make uh, new roads for cars, but then in uh, 72, and that's the next uh, photograph, or the next uh, slide, excuse me. Yeah, this is the, the Great Market Square. It's our main square right in the middle of, of our city. You can see uh, uh, the, our uh, city hall. Um, yeah, it's right in the middle with cars, cars, uh, traffic lights, etc. Of course, you see some uh, cyclists, but the, the, the yeah, most are cars. Can I have the next one? 
that was in the 60s and 70s. And then in 72, there were elections and there were a, a, a few parties uh, uh, in city council. And they said, we don't want to facilitate uh, the car traffic anymore. We have other ideas. We want to facilitate pedestrians, public transport and, and uh, bicycle traffic. So we want to get rid of that plan uh, which we had in 72 of making more roads and, and widen uh, existing roads. And that was in 1977, the introduction in the street of the traffic circulation plan. And if you go, this is the city center um, right in the middle. If you go to the next slide, I think something happens. Yeah, this was the situation before 1977. If you uh, uh, lived outside of the city and you wanted to go somewhere in the city center, for example, to do shopping, you uh, could go by car and uh, you could drive right to the middle of the city center. It was in many uh, cities uh, all over Europe and the rest of the world. This was also the situation in Groningen. Uh, next slide, please. Then uh, the city council at that time said, we want to stop that. We, uh, we will divide uh, the city center in four sectors, four parts, uh, connected with an inner ring road, that's the orange line. Um, can I have the next one? And yeah, if you want to go by car from uh, outside the city to the city center, uh, you can't go through the city center anymore. You have to use uh, the inner ring road, the orange line, and you still can uh, can go to the city center by car, but it will be a lot of uh, more difficult than in the situation before 77. Um, and of course, with this uh, system, we got lots more of uh, bicycle traffic, pedestrians, um, and of course, public transport. Um, and of course, uh, this was only for car traffic. The rest of the transport modes uh, uh, didn't change. They could go from A to B right through the city center. Um, and along uh, the inner ring, so along the, the orange line, uh, we also uh, plan to build parking garages. Uh, so to have the cars outside of the city center and not in the city center anymore. And this uh, plan was uh, introduced uh, in, in overnight uh, from 18th until 19th September 1977. So in one night, of course, there was a lot of discussion that time, especially from, uh, from shopkeepers, because they thought uh, nobody would come to Groningen anymore to, to go for shopping, uh, but they, uh, they got it wrong. If you can, uh, go to the next slide. Yeah, that are the parking garages. Uh, the next one, please. Yeah, this was the situation you see in the in the at the back. You see our uh, famous Martini Tower. You see City Hall, and this is uh, on the Fish Market, uh, one of the two main squares. This was uh, 50 years ago. It's it's uh, it looks like a long time ago, but this was the situation. Car. Uh, uh, yeah, a road right over uh, that square. And if you go to the next one, you see the situation now. This is the situation now on the same spot, of course, from a different angle, but this is the same situation now. So no more cars anymore, no public transport even in this part of the inner city, but only pedestrians, a lot of pedestrians and a lot of cyclists. If you want to go to the next one, that is uh, at the right, you see again, town hall, city hall, and in the left, uh, you can wear something of Martini Tower. Uh, this is also the Great Market Square again. Uh, we then had uh, a, not a big bus station, but a quite uh, a medium uh, bus station right in front of, of town hall. And this is also a situation, I'm 40 years old now, uh, I can remember this. So in the 80s, end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, this was the situation on the Great Market Square. And if you go to the next slide, you can see the situation now. This is the same spot where the bus station was 
uh, there are no buses and no cars anymore. That is one of the examples of the um, uh, traffic circulation plan. The next slide is a situation of one of our uh, main parks. It's right, uh, uh, it's, it's right near the, the city center. It's on the western, northwestern side of the city center. Um, it's from the medieval ages. It's, it were the, uh, uh, yeah, it, it's quite of. I don't know the exact uh, name, but it's it's one of the parks now. It's, and this was also a situation in in red. You see a major road right through uh, the green space um, until uh, yeah the, the the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. This was a situation: uh, thousands or thousands of cars per day uh, through the park. And uh, yeah, you see the two black and white uh, photographs, how the situation was. No um, room for cyclists or even pedestrians in a park. Um, and in the beginning of the 90s, uh, they organized a referendum in 1994. Um, or no, uh, excuse me, in 1993, they said, we want to do a pilot, we want to close uh, the park for cars and we want to use it for pedestrians and for cyclists. Um, there was no consensus about it, so that's why uh, the, the political uh, parties decided then to do a pilot, to just uh, try and, and look what, what happens. Um, they didn't know what to do with it uh, afterwards of the pilot, that was the, the picture in, uh, in at the bottom, that was the temporary closure of the park, quite easy uh, with signs uh, and, and not more uh, infrastructure, so very cheap. And then in 1994, there was a referendum and all uh, inhabitants of the city could uh, vote. Uh, will we leave it this way, so closed for cars, or will we reopen it for, for cars? Um, that was a very exciting referendum. I still can uh, imagine that, uh, remember that a little bit, not that much, but a little bit. <laughs> and it was almost a close call because 51% was pro-closure and 49% was uh, to get to the old situation, uh, back to the old situation. So it was a yeah, very close call. Um, and in 1994, they decided to close it for cars and give more room for uh, pedestrians and for cyclists. Um, when we now, uh, as policy makers, would, would do a proposal to to make uh, to open the road again, I think 99.9% would say you are crazy. So you can see what uh, change what, what things change during uh, during time. And um, the closure of the park for cars, of course, meant uh, a huge increase of cyclists in that period. And uh, in 1994, 1995, after the definitive uh, closure of the park, the, the increase of cyclists was uh, more than 30%. So, and, and it's one of our most uh, uh, famous spots at the moment, especially on, on yeah, beautiful days uh, in spring and summer. It's quite busy there and it's not uh, yeah, imaginable anymore to have cars there. So can I have the next one, please? This is the situation nowadays, so it's a totally total difference uh, than uh, 30 years ago. Uh, next slide, please. This is a slide of our parking policy in the city of uh, Groningen. It's also very important because, um, yeah, what I said in the beginning, many people from outside the city uh, will come by car to, to Groningen. Um, yeah, we don't have problems with that, but we don't want to have them all in the city center, of course. So that's why we have uh, divided the city in different uh, parts. Uh, in the city center itself, you can only park in parking garages along that ring road, the inner ring road. Uh, outside of the city center, you also can park on the street. You have to pay, of course. It's everywhere you have to pay. We are also expanding uh, the next coming of coming years with uh, uh, yeah, more paid parking, so to say. 
And what also is very famous in Groningen are the park and ride uh, facilities around the city. We have now in, in total five park and ride facilities uh, from every direction. Uh, in total, 4,000 parking spaces for cars. Um, it's used very, uh, very, uh, very good. Uh, parking is for free and you can buy a ticket uh, to use the bus, uh, for example. But what we also see uh, the last couple of years is uh, the, the change in park and bike, because many people park their car there on the park and ride facility and then they go by bike. Uh, to the city center or they rent a bike or they have their own bike over there and nowadays we have what I said 4,000 parking spaces for cars but also uh, more than 1,000 parking spaces for cyclists on the PNR facilities so that's uh, quite uh, yeah, increasing so to say. Uh, on the next slide please. Then you can see the, the locations of the five uh, ENR facilities with also the bicycle parking facilities. Um, yeah, normal uh, spaces to park your bike, but also uh, lockers for people who, for example, have a more expensive bike. Um, so a lot of uh, facilities. Uh, the next piece. Yeah, then the situation 10 years ago or no, six years ago, I'm sorry. Um, in 2015, we made uh, our new bicycle strategy. Uh, it was almost uh, 40 years after the um, traffic circulation plan. And our city government and also our, uh, we as policymakers said, we are now 40 years ahead and we have to make a uh, new uh, bicycle policy because things are, have changed. Uh, for instance, the um, the, the upcoming of the the e-bike, for example, uh, 40 years ago, nobody uh, knew uh, about the e-bike, but it, it changed uh, cycling uh, as a as a whole. So that's why in 2015 we uh, made our new bicycle uh, bicycle strategy. Can I have the next slide, please? And in that bicycle uh, strategy, we see uh, uh, some challenges uh, for the city. Um, which we need an answer for, of course. One of the uh, first things is that, that we are, as a city are growing. Um, I told you we have 235,000 inhabitants now, but we will grow the next couple of years. We are one of the fastest growing cities in the Netherlands. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, on the left, you see uh, the, the uh, inhabitant, the increase of the, the inhabitants. Um, you see 225,000 uh, uh, is in the infographic in, in 2025. Um, that was before uh, um, the situation we, we annexed uh, two years ago to uh, um, neighboring uh, communities. So the number of 225 is only the city of Groningen and not the two uh, annexed uh, uh, communities. So in total, we will now grow uh, to, I think, 250,000 inhabitants in 2025. So that means a lot of more people than we had in 2015. Um, one of the other things is uh, keeping the city accessible. What I said, we, ha we have a very dense city in a rural area. And of course, uh, we want to have those people not coming by car to the city, but by public transport or by bicycle. And if they come by car, they have to park uh, their car in the boundaries of the city and go by public transport or by uh, bicycle further into the city center. So that's also one of the main reasons to have a new bicycle strategy. Can I have the next one, please? Uh, the health of inhabitants is, of course, very important. Uh, maybe it's even more important after one year of the pandemic, uh, who should say? Um, but it's, it's uh, yeah, a cyclist is, uh, is uh, at average more healthier than a non-cyclist. So that's also one of the things uh, if you, that's why we, we love to have more cyclists uh, in, in the future. 
obesitas is, is one of the problems in, in the Netherlands, but also in the rest of Europe and other uh, continents. Uh, and we think cyc cycling can help uh, for that, of walking, of course. Um, the fourth thing was uh, the uh, vital city. Um, uh, in Groningen, we don't have uh, large shopping malls at the, uh, at the edges of the city, but we want to have the shops in the city center to have it uh, livable. But then uh, also you have to, uh, you, you, yeah, they have to be accessible uh, by different modes of transport and of course also by, cycle, by bicycle or by public, public transport. So that's very important too. And then the next one, please. Of course, uh, safety is, is of course uh, very important too. Uh, everything you do also with cycling, it has to be safe because if it isn't safe, people won't use their bike. Uh, we got a lot of, uh, before the pandemic started, we got a lot of people, uh, visitors from, from outside the Netherlands, for example, from the UK or from uh, Scandinavia. And there is always the helmet uh, uh, issue, but uh, yeah, in the Netherlands, uh, 99% of cyclists don't wear a helmet because uh, cycling in the Netherlands is safe and why should we wear a helmet? Uh, the next one, please. Um, yeah, those, um, those challenges uh, um, meant also five strategies uh, because yeah, a strategy is about what do we want? What are we going to do the next couple of years? Uh, the next one, please. And we also have five strategies. The first one is, of course, the bicycle comes first. Uh, with everything we do in Groningen, uh, the bicycle is at the first place. Um, this is a picture of the, the main railway station in Groningen. We are now, um, uh, yeah, it's planned to be finished in 2023-24. Um, so they are building now for, for that uh, uh, new railway station. And um, of course, in the railway station, public transport is very important, but also in Groningen and the rest of the Netherlands, most people are going to the railway station by foot or by bicycle. And if, if you want to have people coming by bicycle, then the facilities need to be good. So that's why we uh, are planning to build a bicycle lane right uh, underneath the railway station from, from one side to the other side uh, and connect it with a new bicycle parking facility uh, right in the heart of the railway station. Uh, and yeah, by doing that, um, you, you put the bicycle on the first place after, of course, the pedestrian. Uh, but people will also come by bike and not by car or other. Uh, the next one, please. Uh, the second strategy is the is about the bicycle network. Um, what I said, 99% of our roads uh, uh, are uh, uh, may be used by uh, by, by by cyclists. Uh, but of course, we have also spice, special uh, infrastructure. And uh, sometimes there are missing links or um, uh, infrastructure is, is built 40 years ago with uh, far more or less uh, cyclists than nowadays because the number of cyclists increased very much the last uh, decades. Uh, so th sometimes you have to change or to, to, to make things better. And um, of course, that costs a lot of money. Uh, so that's why we said in Second strategy, um, uh, we spend our money at, at the main uh, bicycle uh, infrastructure, so where most people uh, make use of, uh, because of course, yeah, we can give, uh, we spend the money, we can spend the money only once, and, and that's why we have to make choices. Uh, the next one, please. Yeah, this is a map of the bicycle infrastructure of the main bicycle routes in Groningen. Um, and you also can see here uh, the parking ride facilities in black. You can also, or in white, excuse me, 
Uh, you can also see the regional routes in, uh, from and to Groningen that, that are in black, the bicycle routes plus. Um, and you can also see um, the, the six areas, the yellow areas, that are the main uh, working areas where people work, university, university hospital, railway station. So that are the focus points uh, where most people have to go to go to school or to, uh, to work. The next one, please. The third strategy was more space for cyclists. Um, that means um, yeah, a lot of infrastructure because we started in the 70s with 70s and 80s with building infrastructure for cyclists. Um, that was a, not, was a different time than now, of course. The number of cyclists was, uh, yeah, was uh, less than it nowadays is. And if you have uh, built a bicycle uh, path for, for, let's say, 10,000 cyclists, when there are now 20,000 cyclists, um, yeah, the measurements are not good enough anymore. So you have to, uh, yeah, to, to make uh, improvements. You have, for example, widen the bike path so people can pass. Um, also with e-bikes, uh, the speed the speed of, of cyclists is uh, is increasing. Uh, traffic safety, bicycle safety is more an issue than, than 20 years ago, maybe. Uh, so that's why uh, on, on some spots we made different choices. And uh, sometimes, and that's uh, um, also an example of this strategy, we are uh, in the northeastern part of the city. Uh, it's called the Korreweg. Um, that uh, 15,000 cyclists use that route every day. Um, there is not enough space to, to, to widen the existing bicycle path. And that's why we have now a discussion uh, to get rid of the bicycle path and to make a bicycle street or a bicycle boulevard and put the cyclist uh, yeah, in, in, right in the middle, give them the right of way. And the car traffic and the rest uh, and the bus traffic, they have to wait for uh, for the uh, bicycles. So that's also uh, part of this uh, strategy. Uh, the next slide, please. Yeah, the fourth strategy is about bicycle parking. That's, of course, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, it's a very uh, famous issue. Uh, the last couple of years, we invested a lot of money in bicycle parking at railway stations um, because more and more people uh, went by bike to the uh, railway station to catch a train or a bus. Um, and yeah, we had in Groningen, for example, uh, we have now at the main railway station, we have 10,000 bicycle parkings facilities. Uh, we will now increase them uh, in 2023-2024 to 17,500 bicycle parkings. So almost we, we almost double the amount of uh, facilities. Um, so at the railway stations, we have a lot of plans now, and I hope in the next couple of years we will uh, also uh, build. Uh, in the city center, we have a uh, yeah, real... Uh, uh, issue with bicycle parking, of course, not now during COVID uh, because uh, less people visit in the city. But I think after summer, when uh, everybody uh, got uh, vaccinated, I think the number of parked bikes and the problems and the issues, etc., will be uh, returned. Uh, so we have to uh, invest uh, tens of millions of euros in bicycle parking in the city center in the next couple of years. Uh, the next, please. Yeah, and the fifth strategy, uh, that was a new strategy five, six years ago. Uh, that was the story of Groningen as a cycling city. Um, um, in the Netherlands, in Scandinavia, for example, there were many cities, they, 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 told, they tell what they do with, with cycling in the Netherlands. We just did, but we didn't talk about it. Um, and in uh, 2015, we changed things in Groningen. We said we have to uh, also to inform our own citizens of, for example, what we are doing. Um, because from people outside of Groningen or from, from different countries, we always hear that cycling, uh, that situation in Groningen is very special. 
but we are so used to it, we don't see it anymore. So that was uh, yeah, part of this uh, strategy. Um, now, and for example, we have uh, also made our own bicycle logo, 050. It's our phone, uh, a telephone number. It's uh, everybody in the Netherlands know that 050 is Groningen. And uh, yeah, we made stickers. We put it on the uh, uh, on the uh, trottoirs, on the pavements. But also uh, a few years ago, we did it in the traffic lights. So if the cyclists uh, are waiting for uh, for red, or they can pass through green, they see their own logo. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, then uh, at, at uh, the end of the presentation, some examples. Uh, what very important is, what we also learned uh, the last couple of years is that cycling also in the Netherlands, it's not always, not everybody will always be happy. Uh, there is resistance, uh, not only uh, with car traffic, but also with, uh, with bicycle policy. And it's very important to show also citizens, people who are against uh, 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 measures, for example, uh, to show what, to, what, what they can gain uh, with it. Um, the next one, please. This is an example of the smart route. It's, the, the, it's a bicycle route between the city center uh, at the right uh, and, and the university campus in the north. Um, we had in 2013, so eight years ago, we had problems with the traffic lights, with safety, with uh, yeah, cyclists have to wait and they don't like it, of course. Um, that was during the financial crisis, so we didn't have money to build, for example, uh, a bicycle tunnel. Uh, so that's why, and that's the next slide, I think. Yeah, this is the situation near the ring road. Uh, this was the situation uh, a few years ago, um, and we had here uh, uh, real uh, traffic uh, uh, safety issues with, with accidents between cars and, and bicycles. Um, and we didn't have money at that time to build, for example, 10 million euros uh, a new bicycle tunnel. So we did a different thing. The next slide, please. We promote we promoted uh, uh, two so-called smart routes, one in the west, one in the east. Uh, that were existing routes, um, but m almost every uh, cyclist uh, uh, used the, the the one in the middle because that was in their mental map. Uh, so we promoted it to, uh, by campaigns, etc. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is an example of the, the signs and the signage on the pavement, uh, what we uh, introduced. The next one, please. And here you see the, the number of cyclists in the years after we did the campaign. Um, one of the goals was <coughs> for the, on the uh, orange uh, uh, bicycle route in the middle to have 10% less uh, bicycle traffic and more bicycle traffic at the west and the, the eastern uh, smart route. Uh, but what we see in a couple of years uh, after 2013 was that the number of cyclists uh, yeah, in, 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 uh, exploded uh, uh, to the university campus. But what you also can see is that most of the um, uh, people used after 2013, after our campaign, was using the east and the west route to the university campus. Um, that meant for the eastern route to new, uh, that led to new uh, problems, uh, because what you can see, the number almost doubled on this route. It's, it's now more than 21,000 each day, uh, of course, before COVID. Uh, the next slide, please. And that meant also that the infrastructure was not good for more than 20,000 cyclists each day. This is, was an example. This was part of the route. It was a normal 30 kilometer street. So uh, yeah, nothing wrong with it. Not very beautiful, but nothing wrong with that. Um, the next one, please. This is also a part of that, that route. It's the same as the picture. Uh, next one, please. This is the situation nowadays, and we introduced here uh, the bicycle street together, of course, with the inhabitants uh, 
people who live there of the street. Um, but this has a lot more uh, quality, of course. And um, the inhabitants are very uh, uh, glad with this situation now because it looks more, much more uh, yeah, nicer than the other situation, than the old situation. But also cyclists are, of course, very uh, fond with this. Next one, please. Uh, this is also a part of that uh, Eastern Smart Route. This is the intersection with a 50-kilometer street. Um, car traffic and bus traffic have right of way, so that means that cycle, cyclists have to wait here. But during, especially during morning rush hour, it's uh, that busy that we have uh, a, a line of uh, hundreds of cyclists who are waiting for the car traffic. So in 20, I think 18, um, we did a pilot, kind of a pilot, and we changed the right of way. This was the situation we introduced uh, in 2018. We gave cyclists right of way uh, before car traffic and bus traffic. It's on a 50 kilometer road, so uh, it's quite um, yeah, tricky, so to say. Uh, we introduced this, and uh, after four weeks, unfortunately, we uh, had to bring the old situation back because uh, yeah, cyclists of uh, car traffic drivers weren't used to this situation, and there was a lot of negative uh, uh, publicity in the, in the local press. So at the end, our alderman had to say, or our vice minister had to say, uh, we. we we, we bring back uh, the old situation. Um, and the next one, please. Now we are studying uh, to, to make here a bicycle uh, yeah, viaduct. So bring the car traffic and bus traffic uh, underneath, uh, under the road, and uh, so that um, uh, bicycle traffic can, uh, can flow uh, and, and don't have to wait anymore. But this is, of course, a very uh, expensive uh, situation solution. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, this is, uh, these are some uh, examples of these uh, eastern and western bicycle routes. Um, when we started with the smart route, uh, the bicycle uh, path was two and a half meters wide. So two and a half meters wide bicycle path for 20,000 cyclists, that doesn't work. Um, so uh, in 2017, 2018, we also widened that bicycle path there. That's the next slide, I think. Yeah, this was the situation uh, when we, where, where we worked. Um, you see the old situation, you see the asphalt in the middle, and the new situation, how, it, uh, how it's now. Uh, it's now a four, four meter wide bicycle park, uh, bicycle path. That's also our new standard. So always bicycle path in Groningen uh, will be made four meters wide, two meters in every direction. Um, and this was also uh, yeah, a big issue in politics and also in, uh, with the inhabitants, uh, because this bicycle, main bicycle uh, ro road route was uh, through a park. Uh, and of course, there, are, there were some trees uh, in, in the way, so we had to, uh, to remove those trees. And that was a, a big issue because uh, one of the parties, now the largest party in, in Groningen is the Green Party. And they always have uh, problems. They have 50 percent. They love cycling, but also they love trees. So sometimes they have to choose and that's quite difficult. So there was a lot of uh, debate about this. Uh, the next one, please. Uh, this is another situation on the smart route. This is the Western route. This was a situation a few years ago with a very, um, um, yeah, it was not clear how the situation was. Uh, also, car traffic was has here right of way, um, but it was very uh, difficult. Uh, not many accidents, but a lot of people didn't get how this situation uh, worked. So we studied and we came uh, with a, uh, another solution. That's the next slide. And we introduced here the bicycle roundabout. Um, well, uh, now cyclists have the right of way and the car and the bus have to wait for the cyclists. And um, yeah, everybody is very 
glad with this situation now and nothing happens anymore so it's it's for all parties this, this is a great solution and i think we will uh, introduce this uh, solution uh, on more uh, locations in Groningen in the next couple of years uh, the next one please uh, this is the situation uh, on, on friday and saturday nights in uh, city center it's on the great market square a lot of parked bikes hundreds even thousands sometimes this was also the situation of a few years ago and we said we have a very large square why shouldn't we use that better than uh, than we do it nowadays that's the next slide uh, another one the next one please yeah this is the pop-up bike parking right in the, in the front of, of town hall uh, in with lines and, and bicycle stewards uh, we have uh, made the situation much more better uh, this was two three years ago and since uh, the end of 2019 we have now a bicycle underground bicycle parking of uh, 1500 spaces uh, so now we have a, a different solution but this is one of the, of the um, uh, things you can do uh, it, it doesn't cost a lot of money and it uh, yeah it helps uh, the next one yeah this is the situation now with the bicycle parking which we opened uh, um, a year ago so very comfortable everybody can can use it uh, also people with e-bikes or older people next one please and that was the last slide Oh, excellent, excellent. That was very good. Thank you very much indeed. Just let me take the presentation off and bring that back. So, right, so I think you're still on the main screen at the moment. Let me see if I can change that back again. Um, that's it, that's better. Okay, so, Thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm sure people will, some colleagues will recognise so many, many parallels with Chester um, from so many different angles, even down to the fact that we tried something, we had to take it out again. So um, <laughs> that was that was rather good to hear. But I mean, it, it's um, it's interesting, really, the number of parallels that there are. But I'm going to open for questions now. Um, so the first hand to go up, as, as expected, is Stephen. Yep, Stephen Perry. Yeah, thank you so much. Yep, that was absolutely brilliant. I, I had so many questions, I'm not going to ask them. But what I would like to ask is, uh, and maybe it's embarrassing to do this in public, but would you mind if we had some email correspondence? Because uh, I think your presentation was brilliant. So rather yeah, than course. spend a lot of time now, perhaps we could exchange emails and we could even have a Zoom chat sometime. Thank you yeah, so no much. No problem, no problem. Brilliant, thank you. And John, is it? John Beckett. Yeah, thanks. A, a great presentation. Um, it actually just tells us how far behind we are. But just a, a, a really specific sort of question for you to answer. You you change the width of the cycle paths from two and a half meters to four meters, which is quite interesting. We, we've just increased them to two and a half meters. Mm -hmm. What's the capacity of a two and a half meter wide cycle path compared to a four? Oh, that, that's a very different, difficult question. I don't know because um, <laughs> now what, what we, of course, we have, uh, oh, not, not of course, but in the Netherlands, we have, um, we have kind of standards of, of bicycle infrastructure. We have a, a very uh, thick handbook. And what you see in the last decades, uh, things are changing because what I said, for example, the introduction of, this, of the e-bike and the speed pedelec. Um, and nowadays, uh, we always say we need one meter per cyclist. So if two people uh, cycle next to each other and, and also in the other direction, four, four times, four times four meter, uh, yeah. one meter is four meters. But what the exact capacity is, I, I don't really, I don't know. No, okay. But with 20,000 20, cyclists on a four meter wide uh, bicycle park path, that, that works uh, quite well. But two and a half is, is just, uh, it's, very, it's, it's much too small. 20,000 over what period? 
Excuse me? 20,000 over what period? Uh, one day. One day. Oh. <laughs> there are quite uh, high uh, numbers. So, uh, but we also, um, uh, in the region, uh, the Bicycle Routes Plus, which I showed in, the, in one of the slides, uh, into the region. Um, a few years ago, we, uh, I think, 10, 15 years ago, we started uh, with with, th uh, with three and a half meters wide, but they also, we, we also there uh, make them now four meters wide. Just so four meters wide is kind of a standard. It's not always possible because sometimes there is not, not space enough. And then uh, the minimum uh, wide of a bicycle path in Groningen is now three and a half meters wide. Okay, thank you. That's, that's also... Uh, um, a decision of our city council, so uh, that's quite good to know, uh, because sometimes in in our organisation there's a lot of discussion with with developers or with city uh, other uh, people from the department. But now we always can say three and a half meters is, is the minimum. Four meters is, <coughs> is better. Okay. So I've got Andy first and Benedict. Andy. Thanks, Jeff. Jeff that was that was that was that was great. Um, and actually, I. I I'm not sure we are that far behind, but there's a lot of changes to do. And what I'm asking for is, the, and I think the parallel with Chester was quite strong up until you started talking about the bike strategy. Um, because then things changed, I think, from where we are. We had park and ride sites and ring roads and parking structures and all that sort of stuff. Where there's a, a big difference to me is that you've prioritised the bike over everything else, including buses. Whereas in Chester, we still seem to be struggling uh, in terms of the, you know, the priority of, of, of buses over everything, because that's been the priority up until now. And if buses are the priority, there's a horrible set of compromises start to emerge. But if bikes are the priority, then, everything, then it's a simpler compromise, I think. Maybe that's one of the problems we've had with our bus lanes and active travel routes. How easy was it for the city to come up with that clear priority for bikes over everything else? Um, well, it, it, it started in 77 in, in the city centre. Um, the, the council that time said, uh, uh, yeah, it, it's about bicycle traffic, but also public transport. I think yeah. in the 80s and 90s uh, things changed a little bit, and I think it's it's yeah um, I think it 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 was because of the the, the increase of, of, of the number of cyclists. Um, of course, when we make uh, for example a new bus lane from one park and ride facility to the city center, yeah, on a bus lane there are no bikes in the Netherlands. Uh, that's maybe different from the UK. Yeah. But then, of course, priority is for buses. There's no uh, discussion about that. Um, but in, as a whole, yeah, far more people uh, uh, use the bike. So that's why bicycle and bicycle traffic is so important. And there are, of course, situations also in Groningen where there is uh, debate about uh, should we prioritize at, at a, a special other it's at a certain location, should we prioritize uh, cycling or public transport? Mm, okay. So that, that's also a discussion uh, in, in our city, but at, at overall, uh, we, we for, for decades we say cyclists is, is number one, then public transport and then car traffic. And since uh, a couple of years, um, uh, there is more, um, uh, how should I say, um, there is more interest in, in pedestrian because walking, yeah, in the Netherlands, everybody is born on a bike, so walking pedestrian is, is not a real issue. But the last few years, uh, uh, yeah, pedestrians are, are even more um, prioritized than, than cycling. So we now yeah. always say first pedestrian, then cycling, then public transport, and then car traffic. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I've got three questions left. I've got Bernadette, then Mike, and then Stephen, and I'll finish the questions now at that point then. So, Bernadette. Thank you. 
presentation, lots to think about. Um, I'm particularly interested in the infrastructure around health facilities. So you mentioned your hospital and assuming you've got general practice doctors. How, how do you handle it around those premises and uh, facilities? And perhaps particularly thinking about people with disabilities or more limited mobility uh, problems. Um, and, and what do you mean with that? Because I think, I think, <laughs> go on, Ben. <laughs> I suppose what I'm thinking is some of the people who are travelling to health facilities are more limited, both perhaps in walking or cycling. And how do you handle their needs when that's you know a major route that they would be using? Yeah, of course. Yeah, okay. That's, yeah. No, the, the the hospitals, for example, are of course uh, very good, accessible by public transport. The bus uh, stops right in front of uh, of the hospital, so that's no not not any problem. Um, of course, the hospitals we have two uh, large hospitals in Groningen. One is uh, from the Universal uh, University, and one is a uh, is a different hospital. Um, also, hospitals are are very good, accessible by. Uh, by car, so that, that's not really a big, big issue. Um, but many, uh, for example, our university hospital is one of the, the biggest employers uh, in, in Groningen with uh, 11, 12,000 employees. Um, we try to get uh, most of the people who work there, for example, uh, to go by bike instead of going uh, all doctors by car to, to their work. And I think that is one of the, yeah, that, that works quite well. And for example, that's one of the um, issues in the, in the 1980s. Uh, our university hospital is uh, right uh, built near the city center. Uh, in the 80s, there was discussion to move the, the university hospital outside of the city because it was much uh, better accessible, for example, by car. And uh, in the 80s, uh, yeah, we said together with, of course, the hospital itself to, to, that it was better to stay in the city because uh, the approximate of the of the city centre and yeah, most people who work in the hospital live in the city and it's better to go by uh, by bike or by foot to uh, to their work. Great, thank you very thank much. You. Mike. Yeah, Mike. Muted. Yeah. Yeah, may have actually really enjoyed that. When Andy asked his question about prioritisation, I seem to remember that in the Netherlands, there is a presumption in road traffic legislation and even insurance. If there's an accident between a bike and a car, the presumption is it's the, it's the motorist's fault of the presumption. So that working, that cultural need for working assumption does help you drive some of those prioritisation arguments more readily, I think. Is, is that correct? Mm. Yeah, I think it, I think that's correct. Um, um, yeah, the motorist is responsible. It, it it doesn't mean always, of course, that it that is the motorist his fault because no. cyclists sometimes uh, do things. Uh, well, it's better not to see that. Um, that's true. And I think the other thing also is that um, every every uh, car driver in the Netherlands and in Groningen is also. Uh, a cyclist, and I think that helps uh, helps too. Um, for example, outside, for example, in, in the US, um, yeah, many people uh, are car drivers, and they didn't uh, uh, um, use a, a bicycle uh, uh, never. So, uh, yeah, then you don't know how to use a bicycle, and that you have to to be aware of car drivers, etc. So, I think that also uh, helps a lot. Thank you. It was that cultural change aspect I was getting at. So thank you for that answer. Mm -hmm. Welcome. And finally, Stephen. My question was actually going to be related to, to the culture, actually, because sometimes you can you can install infrastructure, but if it isn't teamed with cultural campaigns, advertisements, you said you said at some point that Dutch people are born on a bike. When did when did this when did this yeah culture of of Dutch people identifying as as cyclists come from? And does that constantly have to be maintained uh, as well? Uh, poof, 
That's a difficult one. Um, I don't know when when it started, but um, uh, most people, yeah, sometimes we say uh, Dutch people were born on a bike. Of course, that's not true, but um, um, we also uh, have to, to uh, do a lot of effort, for example, uh, for, for school children um, to let them go by bike or by foot to their school because uh, we all we, we see if we don't do uh, nothing, if we, we don't do anything, um, you, you can have a situation that, that uh, also school children from, from, the, uh, from, from, from 4 to, to 12 years old uh, 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 will be brought by by car to their school, and that's of course not okay. what we want. So we have to do mm -hmm. effort. Also, for example, immigrants. Uh, it, it's also an issue here. Um, uh, we we also want them to to yeah to 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 get our culture, and and of course also to to use uh, make use of the bike, and not go uh, by public transport or or by car or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, very, very interesting to hear that the, it's a, it's an active thing at such a young age as well. That's a, that's a really key point, I think, actually. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So, well, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. I think the, the, there's a brochure, isn't there, on your website, on the city website, yeah. um, in which some of that strategy was taken from. I think some of the pages came from that, didn't they? Yeah, the strategy is on our website. Uh, yeah, it's, exactly. it's yeah. 48 pages and it's really good. It's very detailed and there's loads of inspiration in there. So um, yeah, and we have also that's the strategy. We have also a program of uh, the periods which we have now 2019-2022. And in that uh, part, it's only in Dutch, so it's not in English, uh, unfortunately, but in that document, uh, you can also see uh, the projects where we are working on in this coalition, uh, uh, during this coalition. So that's also maybe uh, nice to see. Right. Great. Thank you very much indeed. We'll send a link around for that. And of course, well. <laughs> and colleagues will be able to um, see the presentation again afterwards because I think there's a lot of detail in there which I think people would like to see again. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Thank you greatly. I do hope to get over to Groening one day and buy some lunch because mm -hmm. I said I would do that in return. So thank you. Yeah, you're, you're very much. Uh, thank you also. And if you uh, have questions afterwards or so, uh, Garfield has, the, has my details. So uh, please don't hesitate and uh, send an email. Great. Thank you very much. I think a city twinning exercise is coming along. Thank okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Have Cheers. Bye-bye. 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 Right, colleagues. Thank you for that. It's quarter past seven. That's our five minute break and we'll be back at 20 past. OK.
Okay, how are we doing? Christy, are you back? Sorry, I was muted again. Yes, I'm back. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, great. Yeah, I, I thought suddenly I'd lost my own voice then, and um, oh. on, my, on my microphone. Okay, let's let's um, move on then. So um, we've done apology, we've done the introductions, we've had the presentations. So my next, uh, we're down to item five on the agenda. Uh, has anybody got any declarations of interest in the meeting tonight, which they need to make known? Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, you've had the minutes of the last meeting, uh, which was the 11th of February. Um, firstly, can I ask if they represent an accurate record um, as far as you can recall? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I've had no contradictions there, so we'll accept those as recorded. And um, thanks to Christy Lynn and I think Steph as well on my occasion for pulling all this together. Very detailed. Thank you very much indeed. Um, there were no matters arising from that within the um, minutes. There were no actions for anybody to pick up. Um, so, and I think most of these other things will be, most of the things we discussed last week come up this evening anyway. So um, if colleagues are okay, I'll crack on from there. Yes. OK, thank you. So um, before we go into the, the next um, two items, eight and nine, I just want to um, give you a, a short update. Um, as you know, the, the, the last meeting um, um, produced the, the outcome from the about the, um, the travel lanes and the council in response to our submission of our plan um, gave it full support. And they said they're happy to implement that. Well, maybe happy is the wrong way, but they said we're, we're, we're OK to implement that. And they fully supported the decision of the, the, the task force, which I was encouraged by. That also led me to kind of think, well, it's interesting now after this kind of initial kind of five meetings that we've had, and we've, we've had our first kind of um, substantial output of, of where we're going and what our future looks like. And I was very interested to know what um, council had thought when when they set up the task force. What what kind of vision did they have for the future of our of our committee? So I met with um, with uh, Sean and also separately with them um, councillor Shaw and Sean later on, and we discussed that in, in in some depth. One of the things I was particularly struck by really was the. The working groups that we have, and these are the travel lane group and then the four pilots, the amount of work that's going on, the amount of effort and the amount of, if you like, energy and enthusiasm that's taking place in those teams, the amount of knowledge that's going into them. I thought we really do need to make sure that when these recommendations come forward, that we're going to be recognised, we're going to be listened to, we're going to be, you know, helped in order to be able to move our ambitions forward. So this was, if you like, the theme of my discussion. And we talked a long time about this, really, about the various funding methods that we can apply to. I mean, council doesn't have a pot of money waiting for us to just use. It doesn't have that. What we have to do is align it to some particular strategy that's going on at the time. And I think given the way that we have to pull ourselves out of the economy, I think the chances of having any kind of extra money in that way are very, very small. But as you know, there are plenty of schemes coming down the wire now, which we can apply for. And I think I made a list of about 10 in that meeting where we can align ourselves to and, and hopefully tap into. So what Council have said then is that they will help us do that and they will help us find the right particular thing and help us align it and make sure that we can we can access that. Um, oops, screen, wait a second, where's that gone? OK, so um, on that basis, I was um, a bit blank. I will be a second. I'm just going to try and get this back again. I'm not quite sure where it's gone. Um, oh, there we go. It's come back now. Yeah, so 
you'll go back to the the terms of reference and i think something we probably need to do in um either the next meeting or the meeting after that is look at the way that the terms of reference are built it was quite clear from councillor shaw's um understanding that we're here for the long term yeah it isn't just a task and finish group we're here for many years yeah and that there will be projects coming projects going and that new things will come along and we'll apply for those and so on. So I think that what we have to do now is to gear ourselves up for that long term. And perhaps at the next meeting or maybe the meeting after, we'll perhaps need to look at the terms of reference to see how we actually structure ourselves properly for being a committee that lasts for a considerable period. I think as far as the approach to um, accessing the funding is concerned, I think that's perhaps enshrined in the terms of reference um, it says quite clearly that um, the task force is to come forward with recommendations and that's what we'll do. I think if I put it bluntly, it's the jobs of the the job of the working groups, as I call them, to come up with these ideas and, and you know, take them to a certain stage. And then I think it's the the job of the task force itself to make sure that they're in a fit position to put forward to council. Um, and I think that's the way that we will work in the future and all being well, we'll have that interaction and we'll be able to kind of um, move forward on that basis. So I just wanted to kind of outline that really as um, a position that's kind of developed over the last few weeks and I think gives us some kind of clarity about the way forward now for ourselves. Um, so Mike, you've got your hand up yet? Just to say that I was very encouraged by the council supporting the recommendation that had been made, and that gave me hope that the, the work that we're doing is recognised and will also be um, seen as being positive. And also, I think that it's it, it, the council is great to see the council working in partnership with a group like this, because not only are they tight to resource financially in people, but also there is a pool of untapped talent that has not been used as much as it might have been in previous years. So it's fantastic to see that might be possible going forward. Thank you for Mike. Yeah, I agree with you completely there. Yeah, thank you. Stephen. Hi, yes, um, it was just so we mentioned that the various subgroups is coming up with recommendations and ideas about things that can be delivered. Are we going to stay reliant on on the council and, and officers for identifying potential funding sources or are we going to identify someone within ourselves who's actually out there purposefully looking for various funding sources because they don't always have to come down through central government. Sometimes they're national lottery, sometimes they're on the periphery of what we're of what we're doing what what's what's our thoughts there I, I, if there are schemes out there which you've identified you you need to bring them to the table as far as i'm yeah. concerned i okay. mean yeah. we are an independent group and um so therefore you know we we have to look to ourselves if you like to make sure that we can move forward and we can develop these things so mm -hmm. i think if you've got, got an idea we bring it to the table obviously at some point that whatever idea it is has to be resourced and it has to be put into place and therefore we'll need the council's help to see whether or not that infrastructure could be done but yeah, if there's yeah. some money that way then obviously we, we need to be following it if it's there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay thanks very much okay so what i'd like to do now is to go into some um more presentations from um our various working groups so i'm going to ask um Stephen first i'll just put the slides up and then i'm going to move gradually through the next ones because i'm presenting the slides at the moment so just give me a moment while i do that okay is that there Stephen? yeah that's great thank you very much um, well, again, I wanted to just start by thanking everybody for the support you gave us at the end of last meeting. It was a, a challenging task to take on, uh, but the support we got from the team and from you as a task force was appreciated. Uh, the pace that we established in those first three or four weeks, we've actually chosen to maintain. So uh, every week for the last uh, four weeks, we've had a two hour meeting and, and many emails in between. And on that, I also want to thank very much the uh, the input that we've had from the task force, from the working group members. It's been uh, exceptional, so thank you. Uh, next slide, please. I think Garfield may have frozen. Yeah. 
Let's start I try with and... Yeah, if you share. can. Just bear me a second. It... Imagine, Chrissy. Is that showing up? Yep. Could you just put it? Yeah. Full, if you could make it full and presentation shape, that's great. Uh, yes. A bit slow. Oh. Oh, I think if you go to um, slideshow. Yes, <laughs> I'm trying to find it. Sorry. Uh, it's along the top grey bars, up a bit to the uh, right. Oh, yeah. okay. Sorry, perhaps could have done it myself. If you get the next one, that's great. I just hope this is the uh, right version. That's great. Anyway, yeah. So what have we been been doing? The the very first action or decision was to agree with Garfield as as chair and also with the working group that it made sense to treat the Liverpool Road uh, travel lanes within the Upton pilot. Uh, many reasons for doing that, but partly to give us the focus on the the, uh, the travel lane that's caused most uh, problems in the last uh, few months, but also because it felt that uh, the Upton team were able to take that on and my role continues as uh, the chairman of that role as well. So my watching brief has been maintained. The, the, the second thing we've done is we've really looked at um, what we can do. And in fact, we've, as we've progressed, we've realized that we're looking at the full extent of the road from Sainsbury's Roundabout into the city centre, into Foregate or up to the ring road, up to the inner ring road. Um, and in those conversations, we've had great input from four people, many of whom are listening tonight, from Cathy Harrington, who came with a very interesting perspective on the needs of the utility cyclists. We had a great input from Andy Farrell, making us think quite differently about uh, transport from the future. We had input from John Violet, who's uh, ex Cheshire County Council Highways Department and also the local Cycling UK uh, regional uh, representative, who made us think again about what we could do along that stretch where the current active travel lanes are. And we had a great input from Great Borton Parish Council through John Salt, looking much more creatively, if you like, uh, up, up to uh, the uh, the Bill Smith's gyratory from the roundabout, looking at uh, the whole of the environment. So those have been really provocative, positively provocative presentations. Um, we're in the, in, the, in the market looking for experts, and the last presentation we've had is just a, a brilliant example of the sort of things we want to continue to do. We've also built very strongly about developing a communication engagement approach, and in a couple of slides time, uh, one of our team members, Dave, will talk about that because we feel we need to communicate and engage now, particularly communicate. Um, I, I think the message has gone out clearly about the lanes, but it is a pause. We will engage the community and I think people need to understand the work has just started. I don't mean people in this room, but I mean people in the wider community that we've just started our work. We've also feel it's imperative that, as I've said many times now, it's an active pause, not a passive pause. And therefore, this group is consciously and actively looking at what can be done along the travel lanes as installed. And, and again, uh, one of our team will talk about that in a couple of slides time. But finally, maybe I think what we've also realized through this process, particularly in the work under bullet point two there, um, is that we are looking at a long stretch of road, really. And you can't, the, the, one of our criticisms of the existing travel lanes is they are, they don't provide continuity. So when you start looking beyond those, uh, where, what runs into those routes and how they lead on, you begin to think about that whole, what we call in the, the Borton Corridor from the Park and Ride or the St. Louis Roundabout right the way into the city centre, uh, linking in, of course, with what the city centre team are doing with their, with their team. And not only are we talking about transport, we're realising we're talking about place. And those last two or three bullet points have made us think about what how do we move forward? So if I just take the next slide, please, uh, Christy, thank you. What we've been discussing recently is uh, is concluded in this slide here, that we feel that we need to begin to focus a bit more. As I said, the working group, including for several of our previous meetings, even after the last meeting, including members from the, uh, the Liverpool Road uh, group, um, we've been working broadly and together, but we feel the need now to begin to be a bit more specific and focus specifically some of our resources on the travel lanes as they exist, with a particular priority to say, what can we do to modify these to implement maybe some changes this year to see whether we can get a better result. They are experimental, that's what the E stands for, 
And that's the message we need to share and make people understand. And whatever we do, we want to make sure that whatever we do does not cause congestion. It does at least maintain and hopefully improve flow. It does provide some immediate tests for sustainable travel, whether that's buses and bikes or one or other. And again, most importantly, it maintains easy access to the city centre. At the same time, we realise there's a bigger job to be done, broader, deeper, longer, more inclusive, of looking that whole essential corridor into the city centre, looking for really fundamental shifts in the, the modes of transport, re-establishing place, that's not just about transport, it's how the place feels, how people shop, meet, relax and enjoy, particularly in the uh, Great Borton Village area. That would drive con uh, consequential changes in infrastructure. And again, in all cases, it's about maintaining and improving the economic success for the businesses, not just in the city centre, but locally. I think there's 85 businesses along that road that have an interest in getting customers through their door and that's what we want to help them to do. I'm going to ask... Uh, Mike, uh, if you will, is uh, who's will just talk a bit more about about that first bullet point. Mike, are you able to do that, please? Next slide, please. Sure. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, well, good good uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'll do the techie bit, I guess. Uh, just just a, a little recap. Um, just to remind people that the council in autumn 2019. Commission consultant Mark McDonald to do uh, origin destination surveys uh, of vehicle traffic, not, not active travel or public transport, vehicle traffic around the city. So that data is available and very usefully available. And it was, it allowed the council to commission Mott to then do some before and after studies um, last year, which it provided we as a team with some evidence to look at to to form some to help us form our views when it came to making our initial recommendations so that was good um, since then we've been looking with as stephen said with various other people to look at a number of ideas which are worth exploring on the list there the speed limit issues are uh, changing um, uh, lights and crossing regimes, looking at limiting right turns, a whole variety of those kind of issues. Um, and these are things we, we think are worth experimenting with and we need to discuss those with the council because at the end of the day it's the council who has to deliver these kind of solutions. So in order to progress those ideas, uh, what we've asked for, and, and I think this is now in, in place, is access to that 2019 origin and destination data so we can start looking at where the traffic is moving between, the vehicle traffic that is, and then working towards a, a liaison with the uh, councils, traffic engineers and external partners to arrive at some agreed solutions. And indeed, so having some kind of idea about a budget to develop and implement those changes as agreed, I think initially by way of study and then physical developments. Just one passing comment about that great presentation we've just listened to uh, from the Netherlands. Um, what I thought was, was interesting there, one of the points of interest there was the distinction between traffic which is generated outside the city and inside the city. And what the origin destination data will allow us to do is to better understand what that traffic is actually doing, where it's coming from, which is moving along these corridors. To what extent is it feeding the city centre? Is it from is it from outside the city or is it traffic which can be readily substituted for by active travel? That's that's the kind of work I think we need to be now doing. So passing back to Stephen. Yeah, please. thanks very much, Mike. And can we have uh, the next slide, please? And uh, over to Dave Whitehead, who's going to talk for a minute about these. That's great. Thanks, Stephen. Um, just before we start, can I just remind the uh, committee or task force members that you do have a longer version of this of the communication plan? 
um, includes far more detail and it does have the couple of uh, draft communications that we're going to talk about and we're looking to find line as, as soon as possible. Um, so really, I just want to briefly go through this and uh, it will be quick because I don't think any of this rocket science is just common sense, really. Um, from our communication approach, we're, we're looking at four stages, really. First of all, an initial one, which I'll talk about later. Um, and then going forward, we obviously need to do some form of engagement. We need to be very clear on the experiments that we're going to do, and we need to be really clear as well on delivery. Um, and as with experience, you know, while we're doing this, what we really need to be is open. Uh, we need to get that engagement. And, and the big piece in this is really is trust. And I guess the, the bit we need to call out is we're probably going to deliver at points a tough message. Anything to do with climate change is tough. Uh, and something has to be given up in order to get, you know, the appropriate outcome. So, you know, we, we probably need to agree that we do need to give those tough me messages and be honest uh, with them. And because of that, you know, the community needs to be part of the journey and they can buy into the final outcome. You can jump to the next slide, please. Um, again, there's just a variety of methods we need to look at, but really I just want to call out two pieces. And one is we really do need to leverage the existing community channels that we have already. Um, you know, some of the parish councils have spoken about the five or so parishes at the end. We've got a good channel. We've got the communication already um, and we need really need to leverage that as best we can. Um, but as we work through this process as well, we've just got to be really conscious of the difference between those people that are tech savvy. And, and you know, we're, we're, we're talking to a lot of those people at the moment via Facebook and social media and those people that aren't. And we need to obviously make sure that at the appropriate point, we widen that communication to make sure we get the right people. Move to the next slide, please. And really, the key bit is this initial communication approach. And we've spoken about this, and we really do need to get something out in the next couple of weeks. Um, and really, and it's really about the why and the what. Um, we do need to give an update to residents on the process we're undertaking. And I guess one of the clear things is, and, and Stephen's mentioned it, and I'm going to mention it again, the pause is not the end. The pause is the beginning of this process and people really need to understand that, you know, this is we have to do something about the air quality, the issues getting into the city and encouraging people into the city. So what we need to be really clear is the pause is just the start of a process that we're going to do. And the other key part is the what, you know, what are we looking to do? Who the group represents? We've seen, uh, you know, the questions from people about you're not representing me. You know, I can only see cyclists on there. But we need to make sure we do have people from businesses. We do have people from the city centre. We do have drivers. We do have the parishes. So we just need to be very clear that you know we've got a wide scope, and we need to be clear on what the remit is, and we really need to get that out as soon as possible. Like I said, all full details are in the pack, including the two communications, um, and we'd love to try and get that finalised in the next week or two, if possible. And can I hand back to Stephen now for the final piece? Yeah, thank you. The last slide, please. Yeah, so I think as, as, our, as our group is pushing forward with a great deal of motivation, and again, thanks to the two last presenters, um, I, I think we begin to face up to some questions that we would like the uh, task force to help us to address. Not, not, not now, the, the first two are, are fairly generic, but I think we are asking ourselves, how complete is the deliverable that's expected from us? by the authority, obviously through the channels of the, of the task force. But is it just a list of ideas? Why don't you try this and you know, get on with it, as it were? Is it side by side working, uh, involving resources from the authority itself and any partners they work for? Is it saying, well, go and talk to somebody outside, get them to give us a quote and we'll engage? And so obviously there's a spectrum of interface and there's a spectrum of options that doesn't have to be one interface in all cases. But I think we would need guidance on that. We'd like to have guidance on that because that can then begin to define the second bullet point. What do we do in terms of what specific support? We don't want to pester people for support that we can get from somewhere else, but we none, nonetheless support in terms of specialist technical information, relevant data. Mike's talked about the, the origin and uh, destination data and ultimately financial support. And, and I think Steve raised an easy, interesting question about, and indeed Garfield is about looking outside as well as uh, looking inside. And I found uh, Garfield's introduction before these presentations really useful. So thank you for that, both what you said and also the, the significance of it. However, there, there are a couple of things that picked up in the presentation so far where we're asking for pretty immediate support um, through the through the task force and through the, uh, the council as necessary. One is to actually implement 
and deliver some sort of proposal that indicates our that, that represents our initial communication. The um, the task force has seen two drafts. So that one that refers to the work of the task force and one that refers to the work of our particular group. There's lots of scope for discussion on that, but I think our request is: can we work together to get something out PD pretty home quickly? A, a similar point. Um, and again, focus particularly on what Mike was talking about. We would really like to have the opportunity to sit down with the local authority and talk about our ideas for the uh, the short term proposals along the uh, the travel lanes to talk about how we interface with them. And if we can do that again, if we can sit around the table with the right people in the next couple of weeks, that's what we'd like the support to have. Um, so that's it. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and we're happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks very much. I think if I can just come in and. Um... I firstly, apologise for the, my, my sudden disappearance. My broadband line went down, and I was just left without nothing for a moment, so I was a bit panicky there. But certainly, um, thanks for Christy Asian for for picking that up. I think to answer your your point, um, Stephen, the best I can, the I would like to lose this kind of them and us situation. I'd like to move away from that. I'd like to build on what Councillor Shaw was saying about the fact that they want to work very closely with us to produce the best solutions for the city. And what I'd like to do is to kind of look at what you're saying about the fact that we need to work with certain people in council to generate ideas, test ideas. There's no point in going down an idea route if at the end of the day it's just it's just the wrong thing. Yeah. So what it would be ideal and then, you know, we need to set up that infrastructure exactly as you said. But I would like very much on both sides of the of the divide, if you like, to to lose that divide and just simply say, OK, let's work together. You know, who can there be on the council side that could sit with you, Stephen, or whoever it is and uh, and and work through that so that at least we know we're going in the right direction. You know, there's always got to be that question at the end of the day. Well, you know, will the whole council agree? whatever, but at least we know we're going in the right direction. Yeah. Does that help at all? Oh, absolutely. And again, sorry, I, I'm, I'm dis sorry, disappointed. If there's there's absolutely no divide. I, I think, you know, we, we have we as individuals have great working relationships with individuals. I think the question is about priorities and not bombarding with people. So it's about managing resources and expectations. So totally agree. Um, but I just want to make sure, you know, we're asking the right way at the right time to the right person. But thank you. Yes, thanks for your guidance. I agree. No problem. And OK, so before we move on to the next set of slides, I just want to kind of highlight um, for anybody, anybody who's on the call tonight at the Titan 10, I've got some open, I've got some open question time. So um, you've got a, a kind of half an hour or so to kind of prep yourself if you've got any questions you'd like to to put forward of, that haven't been answered by the, the, the session tonight. And I'll try and get answers for you on those. So um, I'll be doing that after these um, next four um, sets. So if I can call on, um, I think it's going to be John who's going to be giving the presentation on South East Chester. Yeah. Thanks, Garfield. I'm pleased to join you all for my first meeting. Peter Bulmer and I are joint leads of the South East Chester pilot and will deliver this presentation between us. Um, could you just move to the next slide, please, Garfield? I think we, we spent a bit of time trying to determine precisely what it is we were trying to achieve uh, over a, a wide spectrum of uh, issues and uh, felt it useful to look at the CWAC targets. I'll just briefly refer to these. Reduce car use by 25% by 2025 and 38% by 2050. Increase cycle use of 8.7% by 25% by 2024 and increased public transport use by of 10% to 18% by 2025. We think the car use targets are tough by 2025. The cycling targets are too easy, but we did come to the conclusion that by far the biggest contributor will be public transport. It took uh, Holland, by the way, 50 years to get to where they are now, so we're not going to get there in five years, so we need to recognise that now. OK, could you move to the next slide, please, uh, Garfield? So why are we doing this? Well, it's to reduce net carbon dioxide, it's to reduce nitrogen dioxide and particulate emissions to below the World Health Organization levels at residential locations and on routes to school and to create safe, high quality, vibrant and viable communities. So increase health and well-being of residents and enhance the vitality of the city centre. So that those sort of issues are guiding our work. Next slide, please, Garfield. 
Just on air quality, I'm going to be quick on this, but it's quite important. Nitrogen dioxide, the World Health Organization limits 40. The average inside Chester is 35, but 91% of the readings um, in, um, well, the A51 readings are greater than 91% of the readings inside the air quality management area. And the readings on the A41 and the Hamburg are higher than 77% of the readings inside the air quality management area. And the PM 2.5 level, the World Health Organization guideline is 10 micrograms per meter cubed. And there are high levels of PM 2.5 on Crystalton routes to school, the centre of Crystalton village, on the A41 through to the Hamburger, and particularly along the A51 building line. This is significant because the current CWEP plan is to, in inverted commas, improve the A51, increase the flow down the A51, but the PM 2.5 levels are well above the World Health Organization level at the moment, and they're about to be reduced again. Next slide, please, Garfield. What are we doing? Well, our early focus is to put the right sort of teams together. The cycling team is in place. Um, Peter's going to tell you a bit about the cycling plan. The public transport plan, we've got a small, small team to make a start, but a skilled team in my view. The walking team or the walking plan team is quite difficult to assemble. We found it difficult to find volunteers who'd be interested in sort of identifying challenges and improvement thoughts for walking to and from Chester. We've assembled a car use team pretty quickly, actually, and they're interested in electrical vehicle charging. They're interested in park and ride. And in the next month, we're going to try and get a good solid terms of reference together for that group. And we already have an air quality working group for the whole of our area, which is um, well advanced with air quality testing. Next slide, please, Garfield. I mentioned Crystalton because um, it's was the starting point for our cycling plans. Crystalton is a school with 1,400 children and 200 teaching staff, and they move in and out of Crystalton Village twice a day. Basically, it's not really a village with a school in it. It's a school within a village. So there are 640,000 movements per year in and out of the school. 300 parents drive to and from the school right up to the front gate twice a day. That's 240,000 movements a year all arriving and leaving over a half hour period. There can be as many as sort of 83 pavement mountings and 18 gridlocks in four days in the middle of Crystalton. And the centre of Crystalton peak flow is 20,000 vehicle a day rate, which compares to 33,000 for the A51 and 17,000 for the A41. Uh, it's worth saying um, that um, this at the end of the day um, is the reason why we engaged a company called Planet to redesign the centre of the village so as to encourage cycling and walking, reduce traffic flows, to reduce speeds and to reduce PM 2.5 on routes to school. Uh, that work actually involved a lot of engagement with the school and the headmaster uh, asked me pretty early on whether or not we'd started looking at routes to school and I said we were thinking about it. And we were, we were very privileged to uh, access the assistance of John Violet who put a team in place and to produce an excellent uh, cycling plan for all of the parishes around the school, which show the routes to and from the school and to and from shops and other important facilities like railway stations in the area. So um, what I'd like to do is hand over to Peter, who's going to talk to you about our cycling plans. Thanks, John. Um, if anybody can hear me, yeah. Um, Crystal Lynn was the first, I think, with the help of John Violet, uh, Littleton, Great Borton, Huntington, and Waverton. Those are the five parishes working together before the pilot, and those were developed over the last year. Um, you can see some of the priorities. John's talked about Crystalton, Littleton with shared use paths, and Great Borton, our parish. Um, we've got a lot of infrastructure from 20, 30 years ago. It's just stop and start. And in our parish, we've got some major crossings there, 41, A51 and A55 crossings. And um, for Huntington, it's key for the students going to Crystalton to get to, uh, from Huntington to Crystalton in a safe um, environment rather than up the Calder Valley across the Hamburger roundabout. And one of the ideas is to cut across back of Satan Camp. Um, and Waverton cycle parking. And for all of us, we feed into the railway station. And you see the bottom right um, photograph that's the current sort of Chard Hill Drive route to the old bank site. So there's an important sort of route into the back of the station. 
uh, we would like to sort of retain. If you can go to the next slide, Garfield. Or... Thank you. It's a bit blurred, but you can see our slice of the pie there for the strategic routes right from the south, from Huntington on the um, east for Crystalton and then Littleton in the north, feeding into uh, the Borton Corridor. And if you go on to the next slide, please. Now, a number of us mentioned the Borton Corridor and Borton Village, um, the shopping area, um, is a key um, corridor. You can see in the green circle, that's where I sort of estimate where the Borton starts. Um, and for the cycle route from the Hamburg, it just stops at the Peacock, which is the far distance in that photograph. And then you try and navigate your way through effectively seven lanes. On the main highway, you've got four lanes there with two parked cars on either side, a footway, and then another lay by to the shops with three lanes as well and three footpaths. It's a major bus route in, including park and ride. Um, and there's no cycle lane, no trees, no seats to sort of have the old fresco coffee outside. There are some village signs and planters installed a few years ago. And uh, I think what we'd like to do is sort of use this as a place shaping, a space reallocation. And I think we need to look at side streets as well because there's some residential streets on the north of this that could be quiet streets, play streets uh, and, and just allow cycling through. And it's all part of our 15 neighbourhood into town. So, uh, you know, one to two miles into the city centre. So I think this is a great opportunity to look at this space. For all of us, this is a key area into the Borton um, corridor. If we go on to the next slide, it's just some examples of uh, Planet have been doing in Preston on the left and Altrincham on the right, you know, befores and after, and there's some of the sketches. Groningham do the sketches as well. I think the visualisation to help people. Plans are all good for some people, but the 3D imagery is really good to excite people, to talk to funders, and look at the opportunities. And these are the final things, but what you go through is various visualisations, various options, and I think Borton and Borton Village is right for this. Um, I think the next slide goes back to John. OK, thanks, Peter. Yeah. Um, Planet was selected actually from uh, five key consultancies throughout the UK to do the work in Crystalton. They did a cracking job and um, we're of the view that they, they have the skills required to take a look at our cycling plans to actually provide an input uh, to improve them where required, but very specifically to visualise them. Uh, they're also pretty skilled in uh, placemaking designs uh, and therefore we, we would like them to quote for the work at Borton. So overall though, we'd like them to visualise a plan for the entire area. Uh, the Chris Club plans that are complete and they're going through consultation with the local residents over the next few weeks. The uh, South East Chester cycling plans, which uh, Peter's just described, and also we'd like them to develop a plan for Borton. Um, the best way of doing this, because the road runs through Borton all the way back to the Bars Roundabout, is to put a team together with Stephen Perry's group uh, to actually work with Planet on this re-engineering of um, this particular area. So we'll do that when we get a response from Planet. We'll put a task team in place using the right people from both teams. So more on this at the next meeting. Um, I'd like to just turn to the next slide, please, uh, Garfield. Uh, this slide um, is, has been prepared by uh, David Beer. I hope David's around. I'd like you to say a few words about this, uh, David. But basically, um, this is a very early thought of the things that need to be part of our early considerations. And we, we have a small team put together. I think the key issue here, by the way, is whether or not this small team, once it's made a start, should actually join with teams from other parts of Chester to look at public transport. I don't know whether, is, is David, are you around? Can you hear me, David? Yes, John, thank you. Would you like to say something about this slide, please? Certainly, yes, thank you. And um, as John says, um, it is a small team um, and uh, just sort of working through the points. Um, we're only just starting on this, so um, this is very much the, the early thoughts. But the plan needs to be developed really to meet the needs and aspirations of the local communities and that's um, addressing the barriers um, but it's also connecting with the people in the uh, local communities to understand the journeys that they want to make so 
it's very much a case of um, consultation with them, uh, gleaning the information that's already in existence um, that the council have um, already uh, in their plans. Um, and through those uh, that understanding of the journeys, we then understand where the network needs to reach. So what are the connections that people want to make that aren't there already? What are the, um, the journeys that people want to make where uh, they're further afield um, and where isn't the network working for people at the moment? So along with the reach of the network, we also want to understand people's priorities for improving both bus and rail services. And that can cover a, a multitude of things. So as well as the journeys themselves, um, there's the waiting environment, so bus stops, uh, the bus station, the rail station, accessibility. Um, can people actually board the services? Can people turn up and go? Um, can people travel if they need to with, um, with carers and those sorts of things? And the information that goes along with uh, bus services um, and things like uh, the busyness of the service are starting to come to the fore. So real time information with that support through apps, through websites, but also um, understanding that some people don't have access to digital information. Fares and ticketing is another one. Flexibility of tickets to um, meet the way that people will want to travel in future. Um, and uh, the discounts across both bus and rail um, as incentives um, for both local people and also for more leisure travel. And we also want to um, think about how tickets um, can um, span across uh, the different modes of travel. So a ticket um, should be able to take you from your doorstep through the connection to bus or rail and then onwards. It should also cover things like um, cycle hire, um, maybe car clubs, things like that. So thinking through the ticket um, enabling you to use public transport. And then looking through what plans are already there so we're not reinventing the wheel. So the operational and strategic plans that Cheshire West and Chester already have, including the root and branch uh, network review um, that is already uh, underway. And then looking at some of the, the, the funding, so rural mobility funding is um, the, the council shortlisted at the moment and is putting um, a costed bid together for that. So the projects need to be taken into account that might enhance the network. Uh, other, other network considerations as well, such as um, is it right to review um, school bus provision maybe? And we know that there was an announcement a couple of weeks ago to upgrade um, Chester Railway Station and for a new station on D side. So rail station um, and rail services need to be included. Looking further afield, Greater Manchester are uh, they've just been running consultations on introducing bus franchising. So that's one to watch. And Wales are doing pilot schemes with more flexible bus services. And there's on demand services that uh, Arriva run with their Arriva Click initiative. And there are many more examples that we can have a look at to understand and share that good practice. But as John said, um, we are just a small team and currently just um, looking at Southeast Chester, is that um, the right thing for the, um, the task force as a whole to do? Or would it be better for um, public transport to be looked at more in the round with the other pilots? Might that be more attractive when you're bringing bus operators to the table and people like Network Rail and um, Northern and um, Transport for Wales? So when you're thinking about those sorts of providers, is it more attractive to be looking at the network uh, in the round? And again, just um, making a plea for resources. We are just a small team, by which I think I mean three people. Um, so if there are others that are interested, particularly from the other pilots, to, to join us so that we've got um, a, a greater number of people and a broader set of skills to be able to um, put our shoulders to the wheel. 
um, then please get in touch. I'm sure Garfield would uh, would welcome um, you dropping a line to him. Um, so I think I think that's um, a good roundup, John. Thank, thanks, David. And uh, Garfield, just to say, I think the focus needs to shift a little bit towards public transport for the task force. And uh, I think that's the finish of our presentation. Thank you. OK, thanks very much, John. And David, completely agree with you as far as the, the kind of cross fertilisation of the, the ideas for um, mm. bus and, and rail linkage. Yeah. So I think now that um, uh, let me go down. Oh, Sandy, yeah. Are you okay still to share, Chrissy, or do you want me to go back to sharing now? Um, sorry, I just broke. Um, I broke up there just because I thought the a lot of the things that were being said there about public transport are already in in play because of the bus uh, task group. So I'd hate to replicate things that are going on already on a borough wide um, level. So I, I just just wanted to intervene there just to highlight that you know there are opportunities to to make sure that we. Um, utilize the sustainable transport task group but also make sure that we have those linkages with the bus task group it seems little sense in, in replicating that um, for a smaller area when we can do it for for the borough if, if that makes sense thanks christy if i could just come back on that point um you may have uh, you may not have got to your to your inbox recently um but i have dropped a line to yourself and jared rhodes to request a meeting so that we can understand those points draw from them but again just as you quite rightly say not duplicate any work that's already underway but we can yeah. benefit from that as well thank you yeah. there is um just to just to add sorry we've come to a list of 35 priorities and we're working them through draft priorities and working those through to priority uh, tasks now to, to take forward so it's probably worth sharing that with you as well and um, having that meeting really and then introducing you back into the uh, bus task group thank you great thanks Okay, I, I see you've got a question, Brian. Can we keep it short because we're really running over yeah. time at the moment? Fantastic set of presentations. Thank you. I totally applaud the move to remove to uh, overcome barriers to move people to using tra public transport more, more and more. But missing from the presentation is actually understand the fuel that's actually going to be in the, the buses and and trains actually providing public transport. So that must be in there somewhere, otherwise you'll, the pollution level will get worse rather than better. OK, good point. I'm sure John's taken that on board. Yeah. OK, yeah. We, thank we, you we, very much. Yeah, can we move on to Andy now, please? Yep, yeah, for Area 2, yeah. Central Chester. Yeah. Yeah. OK, thanks. Mine's a, a, a quick update. Um, if you recall, last time we agreed the terms of reference and started to work on the group. So this is very much work in progress. Uh, we agreed um, uh, the first slide there is really the result of the first meeting that happened a week or so ago. Um, we've now mobilised the team. We've got uh, 14 people um, and they've all kind of volunteered for uh sub teams so um uh regarding kind of the delivery of the components so the first meeting was held and it's going to be held every two weeks to drive the project forward terms of reference were uh, again ratified and the out output form was agreed that's important because um and this may be a reflection on some of the other kind of uh, presentations tonight ours is very much about it's a strategic input into the one city plan uh, so we won't be designing things in detail. We won't be trying to find money for anything. Um, uh, basically, it's kind of thought leadership piece. Um, and we all agree that um, actually, you know, uh, utilising and identifying and sharing and pinching, frankly, good practice from around the world um, uh, would be uh, good here in that there's nothing new. Lots of this has been done before, as per Jap's um, presentation earlier today. Um, so it's made very much a kind of thought, thought leadership piece, and we're not trying to do the council's job. Um, thoughts here, um, uh, Garfield, we need to think about this, is that um, many of these subgroups are now starting to kind of overlap edges. Mm, very much, yes. Uh, and we need to think about how we manage that. Um, yeah. Uh, OK, the, the broad programme was agreed. Um, the components of the work, either the kind of sub sub projects within our programme, for a better word, were agreed and the subgroups have been established to tackle those. The first task they've been given 
uh, is to research their individual kind of theme and, and strand of work and produce a paper, i.e. a toolkit. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, <laughs> so next week is the next, uh, the next uh, meeting, uh, and they're producing a kind of two-page research toolkit paper for that, for that meeting. Next slide, please, Garfield. So the working groups and the components to this kind of um, uh, program are mobility hubs. We talked about that, that, that last time. Um, about smart corridors. And smart corridors actually is where things start to really overlap here, Garfield. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, you know, uh, we can all identify the corridors in, in Chester from the kind of suburbs to the, to the, to the city centre, some of which are being tackled by the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the subgroup that Stephen's looking at. But, of course, there are many more. Um, and there are some interesting uh, thoughts emerging, particularly out of the, uh, the, the presentation earlier today, um, because we've been very much concentrating on what do we do about smart travel and um, active travel along the corridors. Well, maybe the answer may not be in the corridors. It may be in parallel corridors. Um, so there's some kind of thinking outside the kind of the box we've perhaps been thinking about it so far. Another group looking at the mobility marketplace, and that's basically the kind of journey app. Um, and I noticed that appeared in uh, one of the other presentations as well. Uh, there's a set of people who are looking at the first and last mile, and that's basically the ring road, which seems to be a, the major barrier uh, to the town. And that's where there'll be a lot of interface between the smart corridor work and uh, you know the Borton and the Upton work, because they all, they all emerge and, and hit the ring road. Uh, and that's one of the most uncomfortable places in terms of uh, cycling and walking uh, within the town. There's a group looking at city centre living and how we change policies uh, and, uh, and, and develop ways of thinking from city centre living, residential working and visiting. Uh, and a set, bearing in mind Mike's uh, comment just a few moments ago, uh, in terms of gearing up for the new e-world. EVs, for the better word. So those are the kind of working groups that have been established. Uh, feedback on the next meeting, which is Monday. Uh, and I remind all those people who are working on this to, if you haven't met already, could you try and get together? Um, uh, but I know many, many of them are actually actively, actively working on the, the, the task given to them. OK, Garfield, that's where we are. Great. Thanks very much indeed. Um, I think a point on the smart um, lanes, I think that's something I'm really very interested in. It's a way in which we can look at, you know, utilising what we have, but in, in a much smarter way, maybe by electronics that can guide traffic in di direction, yes. depending on the time of day. I think there's so much there we can look at. But thanks again. Really good work. Um, I haven't got any questions up and we're running over, so I'll whip straight on to. Now, I think, um, uh, Caroline, you're going to be giving the presentation on this one. Or do you want us to, to run for you? Uh, no, I'd like to run it if that's OK, but I can't request control for some reason. Is it because Christy's presenting it rather than you? I did have the request yeah. control button before. OK, so if we knock that or out. Just share my own presentation. Don't we to do that? Yeah, you should be able to do that now. OK. OK, thanks Garfield. OK. Hello everyone. So you'll be pleased to know this is a cut down version of our presentation. Um, we do have a larger 30 slide deck with additional and more um, detailed information, which I'm happy to share. Just let me know if you need any further bedtime reading. So it was great to hear that Upton had been chosen as one of the pilots. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the area and why we think it's suitable to trial and promote active travel measures. There are just over 9,000 residents and 4,000 households in Upton. We're home to the world famous Chester Zoo and the local hospital which serves the wider area. Reasonably recently in 2014, the Chester Country Park was developed and sits at the edge of Upton to the rear of the hospital backing onto the canal. There are a number of walking and running trails and it's used by visitors to the hospital and from the wider area for leisure. We also have two high schools, four primary schools with approximately 2,900 children 
traveling to and from school every day. Geographically, we're about two miles to Chester Cathedral and the Greyhound Retail Park, and just over four miles to Cheshire Oaks. We are mostly bounded by the A41 and the A5116 and have good access to the motorways and the A55 expressway. We also have the Greenway close by and canal towpaths running through Upton, behind the zoo and behind the hospital. The park and ride service runs from the zoo and via the hospital to the city centre. And we also have a train station at the beach, giving access to the Wirral and to Liverpool and Chester mainline stations. Upton is a neighbourhood, but it's also a destination. We think we are ideally positioned to reduce avoidable car journeys and make walking and cycling and public transport a viable alternative to driving. But we also want Upton to be a model neighbourhood whose ideas can be replicated elsewhere. Our scope will be journeys that start or end in Upton and sustainable travel for five miles. We don't want to be constrained by war boundaries and we'll also make our final recommendations on the A5116 experimental active travel lanes. We think the biggest potential for Upton is its connections. They just need joining up. When we review the bus lane, we will identify the best use for all modes of transport of the space currently used by the experimental active travel lane. In the last 20 years, cycling has reduced on the A5116. Our origins and destinations analysis will help determine which routes in Upton require safer cycling provision. So we have a number of ideas which we are currently exploring, which we believe will encourage either walking or cycling for journeys within Upton and into the city. We will adopt a whole route approach to developing a cycle route to from des key destinations such as schools, the local playing fields and the three shopping areas within Upton. Ideas which we are currently considering are reclamation. So improving what we already have, identifying the small tweaks that can make walking or cycling an easy choice. This may be as simple as mapping out alternative walking or cycling routes that encourage people to walk or cycle instead and promoting those routes via social media and through connecting with the schools. It could also involve maintenance of hedges and paths. We have active measures, so we have ideas for managing traffic on some key roads that are used by non-residential traffic, taking a shortcut between the A41 and the A5116. We want to work with the bus companies to pilot a value for money offering for journeys to and from the centre. We have identified a number of traffic management ideas which will improve the flow of traffic on the main arterial roads, so they are less likely to consider using the residential roads as a perceived shortcut. We've already started a community speed watch group. If we can reduce traffic on the residential roads, we think we will have a better chance of success to promote more walking and cycling. There are a couple of solutions being provided by Stagecoach in other areas, which we think could be a perfect fit for Upton. Stagecoach Connect, which is an on-demand travel solution for NHS staff, where they can book bus travel to get them to and from their shifts. We are also aware that the hospital have submitted their own plans for sustainable and active travel to their exec and we hope to talk to the hospital about those plans very soon. A value single fare is already being offered in Cambridge for journeys of 2.6 miles. We want to investigate options to reset the bus routes and timetables around Upton and into the city, which will reduce bus miles, encouraging walking a little bit further and provide enough demand to make the routes profitable. By offering a clearer pricing structure, which doesn't require people to commit to weekly or monthly passes to get value for money, we think we can get optimal bus use, which keeps both the residents and the bus companies happy. This could involve the creation of a walk and ride circular bus service, which would cover Upton, the city centre and Hull. We don't believe we should be encouraging people to drive to a park and ride to get a better value ticket 
if there are better and more sustainable options out there. The bus service across Upton is also very patchy at present. We are either underwhelmed or overwhelmed with buses. We believe there is a better way. Eventually, we would hope that the offer of a combined train and bus ticket will once again be offered for people arriving by train at Chester train station. And we want the opportunity to put forward and discuss all our ideas at the upcoming bus service improvement planning sessions. A future enhancement would be the provision of an on-demand service such as Arriva Click, currently offered in Liverpool, Leicester, Wat Watford and Ebbsfleet. We would also like to explore the last half mile travel to school. Every school in Upton has parking situated within half a mile. We want to explore sustainable walking buses which don't rely on parents to volunteer their services. So we're at an early stage of our thinking. We are currently working up our plans for the quick wins, which we have identified, which require light touch or no consultation with the community, such as traffic light sequencing and signalling, which will improve traffic flows and encourage non-residential traffic to stay on the main arterial roads. We want to give something back to the community as quickly as possible to encourage them to walk and cycle and start demanding more of their local council to give them sustainable travel options that work for them. We think Upton has potential to be the next low traffic neighbourhood. It can showcase how you can retrofit safe cycling and walking into a neighbourhood. It has the connections, they just need to be joined up. Upton isn't a place you go through, it's our neighbourhood. Any questions guys? Great presentation, Caroline. Great. Thank you very much. I haven't seen any questions up at the moment. I think people are looking towards their stuff at the moment. But if you have any, you know what to do with your questions. You can put them in the chat or you can um, send them in an email to either Caroline or myself. Thank you very much. I mean, that that was so interesting. There was so much in that that I really want to kind of, you know, dig deeper into. So I'll do this at another time. You'd be pleased to know I won't make a presentation for mine because we've only had one short meeting. I've still got quite a number of other people to get on board the team. So we'll do a full presentation at the next meeting. Um, um, and that will, <laughs> that will save us a little bit of time now. So um, if I can move down to item 10 then and just see if there's any questions at all from anybody on the call tonight um, which they'd like to at least lodge so that we can um, you know maybe find the answer for you and feedback to you if you can either put your hand up or put something in the chat nothing coming through at the moment well you know what to do if you do have a question um, you don't need to do it in this meeting you can okay I think I saw one go up there Andrew Evans yeah yeah, um, hi, I just wanted to say, yeah, great set of presentations, but um, wasn't able, I would have thrown in more questions, but wasn't able to actually access the chat, the chat this evening. Um, but what I'll do is I won't take anybody else's time. I'll put them into email and send them through um, the usual route. OK, great. Thanks very much for that. OK, everybody, so we're, we're more or less at the end now. Um, I have don't, haven't had any notification of any other business apart from a notice, I think, uh, Christy, that um, councillor colleagues will be going into Perda. Is it from next week? Um, so it, apologies, it was just to, to mention that Perda will apply from next week. Um, so the next couple of meetings will be under Perda conditions, which won't affect obviously members of the public, but how councillors interact at the meeting, really. So just to make that aware, really. Yeah, okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for that. So just in closing then, um, most of you will know that um, Sean Trainer is is leaving the council um, uh, this week, I think. And um, I, I owe him a great deal just in these last few months, really, for setting this up and getting it running and giving us all an opportunity to really pull something together, which I'm hoping you've seen tonight is absolutely within our remit to do. So I think that we, um, we should all give a thank you to Sean and if you want to put a kind of a, a thank you and best wishes uh, message in the chat so we can pass those on to Sean um, and um, that that would be good. 
And as usual, I'd like to thank uh, Christy and Lynn for behind the scenes, especially when my Wi-Fi went down earlier on. That was that was great. Now you can see the power of having a backup. Yes, we had a backup set of slides so that they could immediately kick in. So well done, Christy. And lastly, I'd like to thank my teams. As you've seen tonight, the presentations have been absolutely superb. The detail and the work that's gone into this in just, you know, two sessions is, is brilliant. So thanks to those. Thanks very much indeed. And to the lead of those teams. And thank you all for joining tonight. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thanks very much, Sean. Uh, Garfield, thank you. Okay.